<laughs> okay. Well, it's uh, four o'clock, and we'd like to get started with the, the session. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for showing up at one of the late afternoon sessions. It's always kind of a challenge, because I know you've kind of had a busy day and a lot of different things going on tonight. And I know I'd like to rest before I go up to Mount Bachelor or, or gaze at the stars or whatever. But uh, I certainly uh, appreciate uh, you coming to this session. Uh, my name is Gary George. I'm the chair of the Oregon Tribal Gaming Alliance and also a representative of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Pendleton, Oregon, and also the uh, chief executive officer of the Wild Horse Resort and Casino. So I kind of wear three, three different hats in this presentation, but the hat that I'm really wearing for this presentation is my Oregon Tribal Gaming Alliance uh, chairman's hat. The uh, session, we're really kind of focusing on um, what Oregon tribes uh, do here in the state of Oregon, as well as our contributions to uh, the state's economy. And so we do have a report that's going to be made public uh, this Friday, uh, March, was it 19th, I think, or anyway, this Friday. So anyway, this is a copy of the report, and this is a draft copy of it. And many of the points that I'm making today are going to be coming from this report. And so if you want to get a copy of it, I'll go through and show you the uh, website that you can get a copy Friday morning. Um, but it will be made available to the public. And this is a document that the Oregon Tribal Gaming Alliance uh, tries to make available to uh, not only the public, but to our Oregon legislature and other people that really deal with issues on gaming. And tribal gaming is a lot different than uh, commercial gaming, and we'll touch a little bit on that as well. And I guess the real basic point is that tribal gaming is governmental gaming, just like lo the lottery is governmental gaming. And so all the money that's generated by tribal casinos goes back into the community and for a variety of different events. So that report will be available this Friday. So. I know I just sat in on a meeting this morning where we finalized the document. And you'll see in some of my slides that it still says draft on it, but uh, I think none, none of the numbers have changed uh, too much. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And the Oregon Tribal Gaming Alliance, we like to try to inform people about what Indian gaming is. And a lot of people uh, don't understand what Indian gaming is. And um, this session, I hope to provide some insights into what uh, tribal gaming is. So kind of moving forward. Uh, by the way, do we have a Coquill representative here? So yeah, well, thank you very much for the feather and the welcome and uh, the hospitality is kind of common with most tribes. And, and I really appreciate it. And I got mine stuffed in my bag and ready to take home. and. Uh, so I really appreciate the, the welcome gift, so thank you very much. But uh, here in the state of Oregon, there are uh, nine federally recognized tribes. And, uh, and actually, out of those nine tribes, there's a number of different other bands that make up with those tribes. And so when you look at uh, confederated tribes like Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians, uh, there are three tribes, Coos, Lower Umpqua, Sayusla. Uh, but they're all kind of relocated into one area. Uh, they're in Coos Bay. And I know they have some property up there in Florence where they have the Three Rivers Casino, but that was built on a, a, an allotment, hatch allotment uh, that was there. The Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, there's 30 bands of Indians that were all forced to relocate on the Grand Ronde Reservation. And that's why, you know, you kind of see them in the news a lot because they, contend that they represent a number of different people throughout the western side of the state. And they always fight with the Siletz tribe, which uh, <laughs> if you look down there, there's 27 bands uh, there in Siletz. And so, you know, who really represents what bands? And so there's a, you know, a lot of uh, competition amongst tribes about who represents what area and so forth. And But a lot of these bands were forced onto reservations. and. Uh, 
So that's certainly, you know, the issue of um, representation is a, a big issue. Uh, the tribe that I'm with, the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla, there's three uh, bands there, uh, Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla. Um, and I'm proud to say now that I saw Chuck speak uh, this afternoon, he's Cayuse Walla Walla, and that's what I am, Cayuse Walla Walla. So I'm not Umatilla, even though the reservation is called the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Uh, but uh, that's where my lineage comes from. Then you have the Coquille Indian tribe there in uh, Coos Bay. A Cow Creek Band of Umqua Indians uh, there in uh, Canyonville, Oregon. And then, of course, the Klamath Tribes, where he, uh, Chuck is now headed, uh, down there in uh, Chilquin, Oregon. The Burns Paiute Tribe, which is the smallest tribe here in uh, the state, and they're located in Burns, Oregon. And then, of course, the Confederated Tribes of Warren Springs, which uh, has three tribes, which is just north of us, about maybe 30 miles. So those are the bands. And the report that I mentioned was done by the um, Eco Northwest. And Eco Northwest has been working with Oregon tribes since 2003. And they've been putting together the same report. And what we do is that the tribes that are members of the Oregon Tribal Gaming Alliance, we put together our audited information. And by law, we're required to do that and submit that to the Federal Indian Gaming Commission. And so the National Indian Gaming Commission which is a federal agency, and by law we have to do that by the end of April. And so our audited reports get sent to the economist, and they end up putting all the information together and then purging uh, that information. Uh, they get rid of it, and of course they summarize it in this report uh, here. So they see the audited information from the tribes. And so, uh, to get the 2018 and 2019 report, you go to www.econnorthwest.com. And so that's how you can get the report. And they'll have the reports from 2003 to 2019. So this isn't a, a one-time report and done. We've been doing it for a number of different years. So this one, uh, this session, we called it Tribal Gaming Selling Fun. And, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting title. And actually, I got the name Selling Fun from our economist who was uh, doing the report. And I was giving him some of my comments on the report. And he said, you know, tribes really sell fun. If you go to any one of the casinos, that's what we're doing. And uh, here at the Wild Horse Resort and Casino, which is kind of a, a picture of our property, um, you know, we, we try to sell fun. And you know, when you go to a different gaming facility, whether it's in Vegas, Reno, or even a tribal one, or a commercial one, you put $20 in your pocket or $40. And it's, we're trying to compete with the entertainment industry to you know, ha think of coming to Wild Horse or whatever. But uh, you know, I have my partner here who helped us develop the, the mantra that you see up there. You know, together we proudly create a fun, uh, winning, or fun, exciting, and winning experience for everyone. So regardless of what you're doing, uh, we want to create an atmosphere at our tribal casinos where you're going to have fun. And we, and we know that the excitement, the adrenaline gets going when you're a big winner and we want you to uh, experience that. But most and more importantly, uh, we want our staff to provide a winning experience for you, regardless of what you're in, what, if you're in the slots or if you're at the theater or whatever. But just to kind of bring home the point of uh, fun, here at Wild Horse, you know, we have a 24-lane bowling alley. Uh, the city of Pendleton, which is right next to us, uh, doesn't have a bowling alley. So we thought, well, let's build one. And uh, we built one. It's probably one of the nicest in the state of Oregon, according to a lot of people on the western side of the states and everywhere else. But uh, that's our 24-lane bowling alley. And the other part is we have an arcade. Uh, we have golf courses. Um, we have our Tomastolik Cultural Institute, how the West was settled from an Indian perspective. 
or Native American perspective. So I want to create some different opportunities for you. And how do we fit into the, the tourism industry? You know, these are just some numbers that um, we put together based on the counts that we have at Wild Horse and uh, your cell phones. I see a lot of people have cell phones here. Well, when you make a call and other things, we kind of know, or people know that that call came from a certain area. And so we know that uh, we had uh, 1.1 or 1 million 163 986 visits um, last year. And from Oregon, 630, 637,000 came from Oregon. 55% of our people uh, come from the local area. Another 28% came from Washington. And of course, you know where Pendleton is. We're kind of close to the Washington border. And then, of course, uh, Idaho, which is uh, a pretty big market that we're really trying to uh, tap into. 98,000 people came from Idaho. And then, of course, another 103,000 were next to an interstate. So we have people from throughout the United States, truck drivers mainly, uh, that come in and park the rigs and uh, partake in a lot of the different activities there. But we know um, how many people come. And actually, when you if you've ever gone to a casino and they asked you to be a member of their loyalty club, uh, we have a Wild Horse a Players Club and you know we track information about your play and your habits. And so you know there's a lot of agencies out there, organizations that track your da data, you know, what you do and so forth. And oftentimes we can pay for that and uh, get a good feel for what people do. And so I think that makes us a good partner for Travel Oregon and others and uh, agencies about, you know, how many people come to your area and what can we do to capitalize on it? And you can, you can see that. So from this report that I just shared with you or showed you, we have a, a number of different uh, uh, factors that we look at. We look at uh, visitors from uh, in-state and out-of-state. Uh, you saw that we had 1.3 million, I believe, on the last slide, and over 6.6 .6 million visitors that went to Oregon Tribal Casinos. Um, tribal Gaming Hotels, we sold over 434,000 uh, room nights at our tribal casinos, and I think it's important to note that our hotels are not, and even our casinos, aren't in urban areas. They're in rural Oregon, where we provide jobs and so forth. And so that's a, a huge number, and we're you know, pretty proud of the fact that a lot of people come to those areas. I was just talking to a few ladies here, and we were talking about uh, Wild Horse, and when it first opened up, we had five single whites that were just put together, and we had no idea that it was gonna work, but after the first rainstorm came through and everyone was still playing and water falling through the ceilings and they were still pushing the numbers and we we're going, yeah, I think it might work here in Pendleton, huh? And sure enough, it, it did, but uh, you know, we're, we're rural. Uh, tribal gaming, we're one of the largest employers in the rural areas of the state. And when you look at where the tribal casinos are located, um, we provided uh, two, $238.3 million in, um, in labor costs, I believe that is, and we provided 4,571 jobs in our rural communities. Uh, we buy good and services from Oregon businesses, and one of the things that we like to talk about is that we um, generate the money there, and all the money is spent locally. Uh, you know, we don't have any big organizations that come in uh, where we have to do uh, pay some group out of Las Vegas or Atlantic City or anything else. Uh, most of the tribes, I think all the tribes, manage their own uh, tribal casinos and give back to the community. And by law, we're required to do that. Um, so we like to think that uh, we're buying a lot of goods and services from Oregon businesses. We think that we're improving the standard living uh, conditions of all Oregonians, Oregonians, especially those in the rural part of the state. 
Uh, we decrease our reliance on state and federal assistance by having those pe people gainfully employed. Um, the other part is uh, Oregon tribes, uh, through our compact negotiations, we've all set up charitable uh, funds and where we've donated over $8 million in 2019 and uh, 163 million since the inception of tribal gaming back in 1992. So the tribes give back uh, quite a bit that uh, go back into uh, the community. Thank you. Yeah. And the other part, um, you know, we're just, uh, we're, you know, like the, the idea of hooking up with the Oregon Tribal uh, Tourism Group. Uh, they're trying to develop a, a guide to talk about uh, tribes, uh, showcase some of the different uh, activities that they have, and I'm trying to push them to include tribal gaming as a place to go and so forth. And, uh, we want that to begin. We think that we play an important part in the tribal economies, and so we're really uh, pushing for that. Just uh, quickly, I just want to touch on Oregon tribes, and all nine tribes are either treaty uh, recognized tribes. So there are two, Warren Springs and Umatilla. We have treaties with the United States government. And then there's uh, some executive orders, and order tribes by the president himself, but I don't think we have any of those in Oregon. And then we have a lot of uh, restored tribes that were terminated when all the tribes were put together and they ran through a course of termination and then uh, they were restored by Congress. Um, so that established the Oregon Tribal Reservations and they recognized the sovereignty of uh, Oregon tribes. And it's important to note that I don't mention the state because they're not the ones that formed the tribes. It was by federal law that those tribes were established and by treaties. So uh, that's why in some cases, especially during this pandemic, that you saw tribes dealing with it a little differently than the way the state or even federal agencies dealt with it. And in some cases, we have the right of taking fish off reservation, especially when you look at the Columbia River, uh, that there's areas where that was one of our usual and custom areas, and uh, Salilo was one of the gathering places for a lot of tribes uh, in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, uh, where they would congregate during fishing season. It also reserved all off-reservation rights to hunt, graze cattle, gather traditional foods and medicines on public lands, and it implicitly, implicitly reserved water rights to fulfill the principal purpose for which the reservation was established, uh, the right for a homeland. And so those tribes were put on the reservation. And so you would think that just having the ability to get water to your reservation uh, would be an essential function of living um, on your homeland. And it, you know the treaties or executive orders or the restoration acts restored uh, the federal trust responsibility with tribes. So, then the Cabazon decision came up in 1987 where California challenged the right of the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians uh, to conduct gaming and really it was just bingo uh, that they were doing on their tribal lands and the, the state felt that they didn't have the right to do it and they of course felt it otherwise. And so that went to court and um, we even went up to the Supreme Court and uh, uh, the tribe prevailed and that opened up gaming uh, where tribes really could uh, offer the same type of games that are offered by the state in which you reside in. And so Oregon with its VLTs, table games and Keno, Scratch It and everything else, tribes can do that too. Um, so that was part of the uh, compact stuff where uh, Congress asked us to uh, to fulfill under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And tribes weren't happy about it, but we did uh, meet with the state and uh, all of us did, and we uh, adopted a, a compact with them. And you know what formed the foundation of some of the statistics that I'm gonna share with you is that Indian gaming is governmental gaming, it's not commercial gaming. So, you know, we're not, uh, an individual that's trying to open up a tribal or a casino. 
uh, all gaming goes back into different programs and all of our net revenues must be used for uh, to fund tribal government or tribal governmental programs uh, to provide for the general welfare of the tribe uh, to promote economic development uh, to donate to the charitable organizations and to even help fund operations of local governmental agencies, especially if one of our tribal casinos has an impact on any of the services that they provide, like police, for example, might be one. Uh, but uh, that's what the funds can be used for. And so all of our money is turned back into uh, the community. And that's required by federal law. So uh, unless that changes, which I don't see, uh, everyone seems to be pretty happy with that. So. Uh, we continue to move down that path. But uh, gaming, what it did do was that gaming gave us, gave the tribes discretionary funding to fund a lot of different things, improve health, uh, economic development, and diversification. And that's why I think it's important to be involved with organizations like this, Travel Oregon and others, that uh, really can, can move the needle for, for tribes. Uh, public safety, tri our tribal infrastructure, water, sewer, stormwater, garbage, uh, different things. I was thinking septic tanks and I think whatever, <laughs> whatever else they were thinking of in there. In the, so those are the things that we, we can, uh, the tribe can do. Natural resource enhancement and our protection of different things. And you see the tribes really getting involved in protection of fish and wildlife and enhancement and program education. And we do gaming itself. Um, there is a possibility for tribes to share uh, some of their uh, gaming uh, revenue. And it's called in the form of dividends. If your gaming facility is doing well, uh, the federal government will allow you to make a disbursement to tribal members, but it has to, that's after you take care of all those conditions met on the other page. And so you, we kind of have to run through a drill when we have a gaming revenue allocation plan. And most tribes have that here in the state of Oregon. It kind of says this is how we're going to spend the money. But I always like to equate it. You only get a dividend if you're doing well as a business. It's just like Microsoft, Nike, or any other business uh, where they disperse a profit share um, at different times. So again, tribes can offer the same gaming opportunities as the state. So as the state approves different uh, games, tribes can do it too. And so that's the big thing. And in Oregon, our gaming is a little different because uh, the state of Oregon allows uh, class three gaming or VLTs. And each machine that you play at a tribal casino here in Oregon or at a bar or restaurant here in Oregon, they're an independent random generator machine. So the machine is just one thing. Um, and so it hits at different cycles. And then in Washington, the gaming is allowed there and it's more of a class two uh, gaming machine. And it's where all the machines are tied up to one server that uh, tells you whether you're a winner or not. It's not an independent random generator. So there's a difference in Washington versus Oregon um, a gaming machine. So that's a, uh, a big difference. And of course, the social, uh, uh, we get, as far as table games, we can offer all the table games that are offered here in the state. And the same in Washington. Most of the casinos that you see in Washington are basically uh, table games, especially those you, you might see in in my neck of the woods, it's Tri-Cities, Pasco, Richland. Uh, you'll see a lot of casinos there or Yakima, but it's really just table games. So some of the social and economic impacts of Indian gaming take you through a series of uh, slides and information that I find uh, very interesting and information that uh, hopefully you find in interesting is that Oregonians here in the state uh, spend two billion in gaming in 2019, two billion dollars. So that's how many people game. The Oregon Lottery gets 54.7% uh, of it. So Oregon Tribal Gaming isn't the biggest gamer in town. 
Uh, Oregon tribal casinos get 22%. Um, Out-of-state casinos and others, 15.6. So a lot of people from Oregon still go um, to Las Vegas, Reno, and other parts to game, 15%. Uh, then others, uh, different games, uh, rate, uh, horse racing. They might race off to uh, Kentucky to uh, catch a... I think I kind of, yep. And then I moved to um, tourists. The tourists here in the state of Oregon, that number that you saw, as a, or Oregonian spent two billion, but we have uh, tourists visiting Oregon spend another 126 uh, million gaming in Oregon, and um, here um, with our facilities for the tribes, you see that a lot of this money is spent at tribal casinos. So a lot of people with the different amenities and different. Uh, attractions that we have that uh, uh, we get about 77.9 percent of the 126 million and the, the but the, you know even though we get the largest share from tourists you know when you look at everything collectively the Oregon Lottery controls 61.8% of the market, gaming market here in the state of Oregon. And the tribes have 29.6. At one time, tribes were at about 35.5 in 2004, I believe it was, that were, you know, pretty, thought we were kind of on an upward trend, uh, but the lottery got better and more aggressive and got smarter in the way that they ran their games. Um, and so they started getting more of the market share. And then the other is 8.6, which might be your bingos, your uh, horse racing, and other things that are, make up the other part of it. Oregon tribes, uh, we have 7,465 slot machines or VLTs, whereas the state is the largest gamer, and they have 11,530 um, slot machines, but it's over. Uh, 2,186 locations. So every bar, restaurant in your area might have six uh, VLTs in there, but that's what they're allowed to. Oregon tribes, uh, we have 114 house banked uh, table games, um, whereas the state has 3,200 active kino retailers. So, you know, that's kind of what's happening here in, here in the state of Oregon. So this one, this slide's a, a fairly interesting slide where uh, you can see where the gaming market by place and residency in 2019. <coughs> gaming in Oregon and gaming by Oregonians in and out of the state and gaming in Oregon by Oregon residents, by uh, visitors to Oregon. You can see that those numbers are uh, fairly significant but uh, the number that we really looked at uh, was gaming by Oregonians, which was done in Oregon, and then how many people left to go out of state uh, to game. So you can see that $312 million went out of state uh, for gaming uh, here in the state of Oregon. So the other part that this slide shows you, and when you look at it in the full context of the report, you see that competition is uh, uh, really affecting what's uh, happening here in the state of Oregon. Um, I'm here to tell you that uh, the state lottery in Oregon tribal gaming has been relatively flat for the last three years. Uh, we haven't really seen any significant growth. And it's really because uh, gaming in California and Washington have really taken off. And a lot of Oregonians are going to uh, places in California or into Washington. And so we're losing some of that. And so, you know, that's uh, the other part of trying to work with uh, different groups to figure out what we can do to 
uh, help uh, people think of uh, places in Oregon as a place to go. And I have the names of the, you know, the increases of the other casinos like LNA uh, from in Vancouver has really captured a lot of, a lot of the Oregon uh, market there in the Portland area. And then of course, uh, uh, down in Elk Valley, uh, Casino, Lucky Seven, uh, Rain Rock and so forth are in Southern or Northern California that took away from the Southern Oregon markets. Yes, sir. You know, online gaming hasn't really come on uh, on yet. There was uh, a couple places that um, the lottery delayed uh, their online gaming. The Oregon Racing Commission approved two online gaming um, vendors, and one of them had to stop and desist at the end of December, December 31st. So we really haven't had any. Uh, influx and in, nor can I tell you that online gaming at this point in time has a, has had an impact on Oregon tribes. We suspect that it's going to, and especially when the lottery uh, gears up to offer online gaming and where your uh, cell phones and everything else will be coming your slot machine at some point in time. Uh, but right now we're not there, so, uh, but we do expect it to uh, to happen the same with sports betting and other things you know the, the state offered sports betting but it didn't really take off um, it actually you know, it was a very poor, poor performance uh, yeah right <laughs> oh I'm sorry no yeah I had asked how uh, online gaming had uh, affected these numbers and what they um, what the tribes think moving forward on online gaming looks like. Yeah. So those things are still forthcoming, and we know that that's going to be online or coming down the line. So, tribal gaming visits, you know, that, that come to our tribal casinos. Uh, you can see some of the visitation. Uh, you can see that 6.6 .6 number in 2019. You can see that the trend is going down. If you look at 2010, where we had over 8 million visits, um, we've lost about 2 million visits in tribal gaming. Uh, the same with uh, hotel room nights, uh, where it's gone down. Of course, we had one uh, tribal hotel that did close down, which was Canada, uh, just north of us. And that closed down, as so we lost some room nights there. Uh, but one of the, the trends that we noted um, that I'll show you here in a bit is that uh, um, the amount of money that people are spending in gaming has gone up. So individuals, uh, their individual spend has gone up. Uh, but just not as many people are visiting uh, tribal casinos as much as we, they used to. Hotel operations, you can see our occupancy rate, and especially for rural America or rural Oregon, that our occupancy rate has gone up. And this is, of course, where you see one of the drafts, I think at the end of 2018, it's actually 2019. Um, but the rate has moved from 74% up to 82.5%. Uh, and the average daily rate has stayed fairly consistent at $97.23. Uh, and this is the, the trend that I was just mentioning, even though uh, the spend has gone down, but you can see the net spending by individual, the bottom line there, that uh, it's gone from 66 up to $96 that the individual is spending uh, on gaming and how much they spend each one of the visits. Does, does that ADR include comps? Uh, no, we, we deducted you it. You deducted it out? Yeah, okay. it doesn't include comps. So comps will be on top of that, and that's a kind of a normal audit requirement Correct. that we have to always take it out because it's not money that's coming in or nor is the money going out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so... But we do offer comps. Every tribal casino offers comps, but 
And when our auditors look at it and they kind of say, well, gee, he pulled that there and he pulled that there. So it's just a, a big wash. So they pull it out. So we like to think that uh, people think of tribal casinos as a good place to earn a, a good living wage. Um, you can see as you get down per employee, uh, what we pay for our employees and uh, with benefits and so forth, it's around 50,000. And then of course, wages, salaries and tips, you can see that uh, individual makes 37,000. We've had many opportunities where we wanted to um, raise the wage of uh, individuals or move them into management or supervisory positions. And some people just love to be a weight person or table games dealer, which gets paid minimum wage, but they make a lot of money on tips. And I know I can recall one conversation that I had with a individual that just said, you know, I like doing what I'm doing. I don't want to get into management. Uh, I kind of asked him why and I said, well, you know, I like to fish and when I go fish, you know, fish don't talk back to me. So, <laughs> and so, and, and so, and Chuck's comments about being civil, you know, it's kind of some of the issues that uh, our people put up with. But we pay good benefits and employees get uh, good income and uh, actually quite a bit of uh, expenses are taken care of uh, by the employees. And we employ over 900 people and I think all of them feel very uh, comfortable, so to speak, or love doing what they do. So, you know, gaming here in Oregon is very regulated, especially tribal gaming. Uh, we spend close to 12 million on regulations here in the state of Oregon. Uh, the state, on the other hand, when you look at the lottery, even though it's the biggest gamer here in the state, they only spend 4 million, or the 3996, uh, uh, 247. So uh, they have many more slots, but. Uh, the tribes are heavily regulated by Oregon State Police, uh, by the, our own individual tribal gaming commissions, and by the National Indian Gaming Commission. So uh, we spend probably close to $1,600 uh, per VLT, and the state spends about $340 per VLT. So uh, we always think that's too much, but some of it is required, and so. It may take an act of Congress to, to change that. But we do pay quite a bit. The other thing, and some of the things that I like to deal with is, you know, I've always heard this comment that tribes don't pay taxes, and especially our tribal casinos. And I like to differ with them and get into different debates about uh, the taxes that the tribes do pay. And uh, every year we provide um, a rent, a, breakdown of those taxes paid by the tribal, either by tribal individuals or by a tribal facility on behalf of employees. And you can see the state of Oregon gets about 35 million uh, from tribal gaming in 2019. Uh, local governments in Oregon property taxes and other, they get about 16.3 million uh, from the different uh, 10 tribal casinos that you see here in the state of Oregon. Uh, the U.S. federal government gets 108 million. So, in all, we provide and pay for 159 or 160 million in, in taxes that go to um, the different state. And uh, you know, there are some cases where the tribe in, uh, does um, enact its own tax, but you don't see it a lot on these papers. Too small to report. So but most of the taxes go back to that. And the other part that the tribes have always, and you know, so I called out uh, Cookwell because, you know, the tribes have always been hospitable. And, um, you know, this year we gave out eight million, but over the time, uh, you know, the Umatilla tribes and other tribes really didn't need a compact to give to people around us. They've been doing it since time immemorial uh, but they've been helping out with uh, different things. And uh, we started doing it in 92, long before any compacts and uh, different things. But over the course of the 
of those years, you know, we gave out 163. We, uh, the state made us start accounting for it, so we started accounting for it. So, um, but uh, to invest in our communities. Economic impacts by Oregon tribes. Uh, this I just wanted to really show you. This is where our gaming revenues and how much we have generated as to, far as total net revenue in 2019 was 641 million. And then uh, we just kind of ran through some selected uh, expenditures, you know, labor, utilities. And one of the big points that uh, I've been talking to a few people, and especially as uh, Travel Oregon and others in your local communities try to build up uh, promotional campaigns and so forth, that tribal casinos have great marketing programs. And it's always good to get aligned with uh, tribal uh, gaming uh, partners, so to speak, because we spend over $40.4 million just on advertising and promoting our own tribal casinos. And just think of the different things that if we work together that uh, collaborate and the different things, I think even Chuck mentioned that in his presentation that we might get a lot of bang for it. But um, you can see um, cost of goods sold, uh, the different food and beverage items that we buy. Uh, we spend a lot of money locally um, with the different vendors. Yeah. Um, repairs and maintenance, we go to the shops and so forth. But uh, probably the most important point with this slide is that the money generally stays in Oregon. And so everything that we do is recirculated back in our tribal community, our local communities, and sometimes regional. But, you know, sometimes I kind of, every time I make that statement, I think of a Cisco or something where we buy our food product. They have, of course, a plant in Wilsonville and other places, but it's a large corporation. But we buy it from Oregon, so uh, <laughs> but I think about you know different things like that. Uh, but uh, and they create jobs in different places. So um, and then of course you can see uh, just for tribal government that we spend a hundred or we send down 183 million to tribal governments to help fund their services. And of course they reinvest it in a number of different things. You know, I, I say that we send down 183 million and they distribute 98.6. So I ask, well, where's that other part going? And you'll have to ask the tribe for that. I know that we have investment plans. Uh, the tribe is a rainy day fund just in case something happens. And I think that's from history, you know, that there've been a number of times where uh, we weren't, uh, we had problems and we call ourselves a retro budget tribe. And so a retro budget tribe means that we live off today what we earned last year. And so we're not making projections uh, about what might be coming in or not. And so our tribe made a conscious effort to only spend the money that we have in a bank. And so I think other tribes might have done that. But uh, you can see the natural resources, family and social services, public works, safety, administration, education, job training, healthcare programs, and, and some of those investment pools in, include economic development, uh, land purchases, and, and education, elders assistance, uh, scholar, when I say education, scholarships, and so forth, uh, that we try to reinvest that. So getting close to the end of the presentation, but you know, going into the, the 21st or 22nd uh, century, uh, you know, I'd like to encourage at least those people and tribes and our partners to, to work together and tribes can help with leadership or whatever to uh, help move and advance uh, projects, initiatives uh, that you might want to do. Um, gaming, there's a value proposition uh, for entertainment. Um, you know, we can offer, and you see tribes doing that, where we offer a lot of different entertainment venues to attract people to the area, uh, concerts and, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of benefit for everyone to be involved in that. 
um, and trying to think of what group do you want. Uh, partnerships, you know, tribal gaming, we're always looking to, uh, to overcome this barrier uh, being a partner. Uh, there's a, something going on and, and I think it gets back to uh, taxes and what we pay and versus what someone else might think that we don't pay. Uh, so those misunderstanding and, and also create uh, some barriers, but uh, partnership with different groups um, help advance uh, all of our goals of trying to create a better uh, community for all of us. Uh, coalitions with Oregon tribes. I'm, I'm trying to collate with uh, the Oregon travel industry and Michelle there, she's one of the big wigs with the Oregon tribal working <laughs> group. <laughs> And, so, and we've had her come to our meetings to talk about what their efforts have been. So, you know, we, we look at trying to collate, uh, collate with uh, different groups and making sure that we can work together. Uh, planning for the future, I showed you a bunch of numbers and, um, you know, planning for the future. You know, one of the, you saw some of the trends and those are trends that we're concerned about. We're concerned about uh, tribal casinos, uh, gaming shares fell from 35 to 29. Uh, you see, and if you looked at it, the visits were going down. And why is that? And uh, could be age. Um, as we all get older, you know, we, um, we don't go out as much. And then we're seeing a younger generation. So how do you get that younger generation to think about going to a brick and mortar place? And to answer, you know, a person's question on online gaming, you know, we're scared about that because people love their technology right now. And, you know, we've invested, and I showed you photos of our place where we invested uh, millions into Pendleton, Oregon. And, uh, you know, going into online gaming uh, just scares us because, uh, well, I think most of it's paid off, but, you know, there's still part of it that isn't. Uh, so, and, you know, do we, what do we do next? So those are some of the questions that we're really facing right now, especially as we look at online gaming and others, is where do we go from there? So we're looking at uh, trends, and I think everyone in the tourism business might be looking at the, the same demographics. You know, what do we do to appeal to a younger generation that maybe doesn't have an interest in going out to... Mount Bachelor or Stargazing or the, because their time is so valuable. And I think I've heard it a couple times in different presentations about, you know, trying to get time to do different things is becoming harder uh, for people. So learning from the past, um, then of course us as tribes, we still have a responsibility of caring for our tribal membership our staff and our local community. So we'll continue to do that. And the other part that um, ties in is, you know, the tribe is always careful about how its tradition and its culture is carried out and represented. Um, and so we continue to uh, figure out how we, how we do that. Last few slides, just, uh, uh, just throw these in just for fun. Uh, but you see Pendleton, Oregon, and, you know, this is a marketing team. I think Michelle might have even had. She used to be our marketing director at one time. But, um, you know, we'd kind of say this is us right in the middle of the center. And we appeal to a number of different people. So we look at uh, geographic locations within 50 miles of Pendleton, within 75 miles, within 100 miles, 200. And you can see that our reach uh, goes quite a bit throughout the state. And when I talk about these coalitions and working together, partnerships and things, you know, that's what we're trying to attract, those people. And we have experts that are kind of going through that. And you can even see by the statistics that we're showing you today that uh, I think we know what we're talking about and how we're really generating um, things. And every tribe probably has that um, kind of that same model. And, and then, of course, you do it by drive time and so forth. But that's just to show you, you know, just some of the different uh, uh, aspects of what we do. Some of the challenges that we have, 
uh, just what the gentleman there in the back asked, uh, online gaming, uh, mobile gaming. Uh, that's uh, going to be very difficult. Uh, the lottery, and with Governor Brown's assistant, we got them to do a one-year reprieve. Uh, but Governor Brown goes out of office uh, in January, but November, I think, with the elections, she's effectively a, a lame duck, I think is what they call it. So, so she won't get much uh, passed, but uh, uh, we do have a one-year reprieve with the Oregon Lottery, but they're developing games now for online gaming. And so they're looking to roll it out even better than what they had before. Uh, sports betting, um, tribes are a little bit uh, pro, uh, restricted, I guess, is a better way of how to do online uh, sports betting. Um, you know, we're, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act only allowed us to game on tribal land, so to speak. And so we're geofenced in to our reservations. And um, there's not a lot of people that live on our reservations because we're in the rural parts of the state. And so it doesn't make it very cost effective for us. And so the only thing that we can do is maybe put up a, a betting parlor in our tribal casino and hope that a lot of people come. But they handle, uh, there's a lot of money when you see all this revenue from sports betting is the handle. And then it goes through a lot of different filters and by the time it gets to the bottom, the net profit is, if you have a net profit, yeah, <laughs> is very minor. So, so that's something that we're looking at. So gaming regulation, um, we're always on the capital steps uh, because there's somebody that wants to do something about uh, uh, gaming. And we have you know, dealt with people that are anti-gaming but love the tribes. And we have people that are just anti-gaming, period. And then we have others that are looking for ways to become rich themselves. So uh, it's been kind of an interesting uh, process. Uh, challenges to the tribe's sovereign immunity and what they're doing. There are a number of uh, court challenges that are happening in Washington, D.C. right now that are challenging the tribe's authority, a sovereign authority um, in the state of Washington. So uh, we're, everyone's watching that. Um, and again, uh, the information that we talked about in all the different uh, slides will be made available to the public uh, this Friday. So in the two different sites. I don't even know how, how am I doing on time. I don't have a clock up here. 4.53 again. You know, I just threw this in there because, you know, you know, I look at it, I kind of showed you the statewide and kind of share some of the economic impacts at Wild Horse um, that we, we kind of look at, and I challenge my marketing people. Over 1 million visitors, 70% uh, of our visitors coming in for 50 miles or further. So there's still a lot of people that are still coming, whether they're from Oregon or wherever, that are still traveling to Pendleton uh, to come see us. 58% uh, of our guests will visit other uh, attractions in the area. Uh, so it's just not wild horse they're coming to see. They're going to go to Pendleton and, and take part in other amenities. 62% uh, of them shop or dine in the area. Uh, Wild Horse, we provide over 900 jobs and 30 million in wages and benefits. And those same employees, they shop local and spend local. Um, the other thing is, you know, we encourage local uh, businesses to become a vendor because we spend 24 million uh, locally on vendors. And uh, it's a great opportunity to work with Wild Horse. And I know that in our marketing budget, uh, since I'm CEO, I get to see it, and they're, they're devoting you know, 40 to 45% of a large budget uh, to advertising. And so a lot of money that's being spent uh, that we could work together. And you know, the big part that I mentioned just briefly is that you know, we have a lot of events that are different, or tribal casinos that draw in people that everyone's going to benefit from. And working together, um, you know, we, 
we tried that with work together looking at the poker tournament and we try to work with other hoteliers and so forth because we bring in close to 500, 600 poker players. And we only have 300 rooms. And so we're trying to work out arrangements to work with the local hotels and tell them that they're going to get a, we're going to have a, a, a lot of players that are going to spend money and they need a place to stay. And so just those different types of events. And, uh, golf, uh, one of the things that we're going to venture into this year is that we're looking at uh, the Epson Tour, or which is the um, Symmetra Tour, but it's the road to the LPGA, and it's a week-long event, and uh, we're hoping that uh, we get a lot of traction out of that. Uh, but for a full week, we're going to have some lady professional golfers, and if you've ever seen them, they're, they're great golfers, and they're awesome. And um, they're professionals, and they're from throughout the world. Uh, we'll have 50 countries represented at Wild Horse this summer, and so, uh, so we're pretty um, pretty happy about that. Uh, but it's bringing in a, an event for a full week, and so we haven't really rolled it out yet. But uh, you know that's something that we'll be looking at, and then concerts, conferences. I have a big conference in, in May. We have a big conference in May uh, that uh, we just don't have enough rooms. And everyone wants to stay in a tower, and we're completely booked in our tower that you saw there. So, And some of the other businesses that we've built, uh, Travel Gaming, our new governance center, our health clinic, new housing, uh, Cayuse Holdings, and, of course, our Arrowhead. So with that, that kind of concludes my presentation. Do you have any questions and uh, anything? But a lot of information, and uh, you can comb through the report on Friday morning, and it'll be very interesting and good for a lot of people in tribal gaming, as well as uh, if you're just interested in knowing about what tribes do with their money. It's great. Um, I think it would be kind of, well, I'm really loud. <laughs> <laughs> I know, world. I hear you. Everyone in the world. Um, so I'm from Chinook Winds, and I, we always partner with Lincoln City, and Michelle has done a great job with that. But I think a session, and I was talking to Michelle about it earlier, and Stephanie and Ed here, is I think a great session for Travel Oregon would be how to partner with your local DMOs. Because I think we have a great relationship. I think you probably have a great relationship, right? And so I think that there's people who maybe don't know how to partner with us mm -hmm. and, and how that looks um, like. So I think that'd be kind of a interesting session down the road because I think that one of your slides was talking about that is that opportunity for us to partner. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that might be this is a good precursor to that. Yeah, I think that would be a great session because, you know, you, we do have relationships that are good, but to get over the hump, uh, there's still a lot of work that need to do. And I don't know if they're associated with the chamber. At one time, I, I promised the chamber that I would give them, you know, $50,000 to help them with their, whatever they wanted to do, but they needed to include the tribes, but nothing ever came of that. So, but I've done it with rodeos and everything else too. So, so. yes. Oh, which side? There you go. Right. <clears throat> yes. Is there, um, is there any connection or current study, um, with lost visits in conjunction with the continued decline in tobacco use in the state of Oregon? And has there been any study on the, in, the environmental kind of experience um, that people are uh, connecting with on your property? Um, here in Oregon, I'm not aware of any studies. I think maybe some individual tribes might have done their own study. I know that we've looked at it. We haven't really taken a thorough examination of it, but um, you know, having two years of COVID on our back and we allowed smoking in certain areas of the casino, but once COVID hit, we stopped. And um, for the last two years, we've been doing okay. Of course, we closed down for 74 days, but uh, um, it stopped. And as we open up and with the removal or lifting of the face mask, you know, we haven't really seen a decline in revenue. So it's one where we've made a pledge to our board uh, that will uh, still say non-smoking 
and uh, we'll take a look at it later. But uh, um, and I think a large part of other casinos are doing it. I don't know about Chinook Wines. Yeah, we're still not smoking. We have a non-smoking room. Yeah. Yeah. People want to smoke. They have to go outside, and we've yeah. got a special area for them. But we're non-smoking, and we're not an interest not interested in doing it and from the Oregon Tribal Gaming Alliance we put together a little subcommittee um, to study it uh, but it didn't get very far because everyone just stopped smoking period so but everyone's happy right now so, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I'm Lori Roach and I have visited the wild horse from time to time over the last 20 years probably and I just want to say that I have always had a good time. Mm -hmm. I've always um, enjoyed everybody I've come across at work there, from Arrowhead to um, the money cage, to the waiters and waitresses, the um, maid service. Uh, anybody out there is friendly and um, just, I've al I haven't always won, but I've always had a good time. <laughs> and on my birthday I got out and I won enough to get a necklace. Yeah. <laughs> at the gift shop. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, you you do a great job, and um, I know that leadership really shows down the mm -hmm. line, and down the line is awesome. Good, thank you. Yeah, I know that a lot of tribal casinos, and you know, just thinking of what, as you were talking about the different things that we offer at Wild Horse, a Cineplex, bowling alley, a food court, uh, where we employ local vendors to run the food court. Um, having agreements with them, so they've come in there and kind of capitalized on the people that we draw. Um, the golf course, RV park, hotel, um, just a lot of different amenities. And we want to become, when we grow up, we want to be a destination resort. That's what we want to be, because we just don't think that we can rely on gaming all the time. So we're trying to build it up so that people think of us as a halfway point. We're kind of, if I showed you that map again, you'll see that. Portland's three hours away, Boise's three hours away, Spokane's three hours away, uh, Yakima's two hours, uh, Seattle's four and a half hours. So, you know, we kind of want them to think, of, hey, there's a great, great place to stop in Pendleton. So, and that's what we're trying to build. And I think all tribal casinos are kind of looking at it and diversifying a little bit. So. Yes. I just want to thank you for this presentation. I uh, think that there are so many people that truly don't understand the economic mm -hmm. impact tribe mm -hmm. make, tribes make to the state and to rural Oregon. So mm -hmm. thank you for being here and thank you for thank making you. this presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, Oregon tribes uh, make a big contribution to the state economy, at least to one point. Three million, one point four million billion, excuse me, billion dollars to the state economy. So I really want to thank you for, you know, spending the last hour of your day, <laughs> or maybe not the last hour of your day, <laughs> but you're going on those other excursions. But, <laughs> but uh, I certainly appreciate the, uh, you attending, and uh, so have a great week. So thank you. <laughs>